Oh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to open the, this. Welcome to the 513th meeting of the Canterbury Regional Council. Uh, we'll just start with the Karakia. So uh, I'll ask uh, Councillor Craig Pauling uh, to open with the Karakia, please. Uh, kia ora, Jedi. A tēnā tātou, e nā mana, e nā reo, e nā ranga te rama. A kā hui, mai nei, tēnei hui, o te kauni hira tai o ki waita. A e nā tini aitua, hai e haere hariatura. A rātou, ki a rātou, tātou, ki a tātou, te hunga ora. A nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou. Uh, so welcome uh, everybody, just sharing the welcomes. Uh, from Jenny and the rest of the councillors to everyone who uh, have come to this meeting today um, on the auspicious day of uh, the first day of Level 2. Um, want to acknowledge all of our communities, our staff, our fellow councillors for the sacrifices everyone's made during this time and of course to those that have continued to work right through and of course those that are facing hardship. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to some return to normal. Uh, but that we do this with some caution and continued compassion uh, until the road ahead is clear. Uh, I want to give a special acknowledgement to the chairs of our regional committee, our CWMS regional committee and our zone committees from Ashburton, Waimakariri and Kaikoura. So welcome to uh, you, Hugh Logan, Tenakwe, uh, Ted Howard, Tenakwe, uh, Michael Blackwell, Tenakwe and William Thomas, Tenakwe, Tenakoto, Edo Rangatera uh, so I'm just going to begin with a karakia, uh, which actually talks about the dawning of a new day. Um, it talks about the different stages of the morning, of the light, of the birds awakening and singing, um, and then when the dawn finally breaks. Kahaya te ata, ka hapara te ata, ka koro ki te manu, ka wairori te kutu, ko te ata nui ka haraina, ka taki te umere. He po, he po, he ao, kawatea, atihei, mauri ora. Kia ora uh, Thank you, uh, Councillor Pauling, uh, for that welcome. And um, I will just also say welcome to the uh, Chair of the CWMS, uh, Hugh, and the members of the chairs of the zone committees. Uh, Craig has already welcomed you, but I also believe um, we have uh, Cameron Henderson coming online also from Waimakariri. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that on Saturday, it'll be one year since uh, Canterbury Regional Council was the first regional council in New Zealand uh, to declare a climate change emergency. And that is extremely significant given the era we're living in. Uh, everybody will be pleased to know that we are celebrating that climate change is now an integrated program across our council work. And we are continuing to extend that work and embed it even more fully in the rest of our delivery. Today, uh, we will also be, as, as Craig said, uh, celebrating coming out of our isolation uh, and the wonderful job we've all done collectively in working uh, to around this international health emergency that we find ourselves in as a civilization. So it's really important to emphasise that it certainly has highlighted the, diff the inequities in our society, especially in the way that some of us middle class people have been very lucky to continue having jobs and to continue living our pretty privileged lives. Um, and we have found it hard. So I'd just like to acknowledge all those people that aren't in that situation and that we all need to be working particularly with the recovery, and we have worked really hard already to collaborate across Canterbury with all the other councillors, councils, and particularly the Greater Christchurch Partnership to f help uh, in the recovery work. And staff have done a fantastic job. Our staff have been exceptional, exceptionally excellent in how we've worked through this whole COVID-19 period. So, just moving on then to the more mundane issues around the
the difficulties with running these meetings online. Uh, so we have to have some rules around how we're going to do it today. Uh, we have the chat function. Uh, in the chat, we will only we'll only be able to one, run one conversation in this meeting, and that's the, the conversation where we're strictly talking, not in the chat line. So the chat line will be used uh, to indicate you've got a question or indicate that you want to speak or to vote uh, um, yes um, and uh, no if you want to use it for that. Um, and um, movers and seconders uh, will be doing that as we go along. Uh, so I will be uh, calling for movers and seconders. So we'll move on to the formal part of the meeting. Uh, first of all, apologies. There are no apologies. Conflicts of interest, there are none that I've been made aware of. Uh, public forum, deputations and petitions. Uh, we are unaware of any calling for uh, public deputations this morning. We're now turning to the minutes of the, the um, various meetings. So first of all, we'll go to the minutes um, of the uh, 16th of April. Has anybody uh, got any inaccuracies that they've found in those minutes? Genius, Peter. Yes, Peter. Jenny, under the, and I haven't got a copy in front of me of the minutes themselves, but just noting under Rangatata Flood Recovery, uh, bullet point three uh, reads a request for land re use review in the floodplain at stage two and three. I was I was of the opinion that, that that was only at stage three we would do that, not stage two and three. All right, well, thank you. I'll ask the secretary to, um, well, is there a staff member online that could give us some advice? Nadine here. Peter, what, sorry, number are you referring to? It's a bullet point under the, the item that says, in the, in the minutes that says Rangatata flood recovery. And it's the third bullet point down. And it reads, and I'm, I may I may be paraphrasing this, a request for a land use review in the floodplain at stage two and three of the work. And now I was aware that we were going to do um, a, a rating review that would take that into account, not at stage two, but that rating review was at stage three. Yes, Peter, you are correct. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nadine. Uh, we will um, make that change in the minutes, Louise. Um, uh, just from a minute taking perspective, some councillors did suggest it uh, to include it at level two, but I'm happy to take the reference to level two out. All right, thank you. That seems to be technically correct. Um, thank you for that advice, Nadine. Uh, so, um, Kelda, uh, Jenny, I, mean, I have another. I have another point under 8.2. So the first 8 .2. bullet point, um, yeah, the first bullet point, it's um, just to note that it's Tarunanga or Arofenua. So there needs to be a little O between Runanga and Arofenua. And there's also a macron, a little line above the first U in Runanga. And I also felt that the word should be. Um, the importance of keeping Timuru District Council and Tarunango Arofenua involved and updated, not just updated. So that was what I took from the last meeting. Small change, but important. All right, um, Louise, are you all, all right with those? Have you have you um, you've noted those changes? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. So are there any other issues that people want to raise? Uh, yes, Councillor Clearwater. Well, Jenny, just in relation to your report, actually, um, on, on the 16th, for the 16th of April, that yes. I, item 8.1, just ha yes. ha how important actually that this item was for our, our coming uh, annual plan. Um, like, for example, the, Noting that the recovery planning began begins immediately, and consideration of what key projects and initiatives should be prioritised. The other part, decisions being made on the annual plan and planning the long term must take recovery and resilience into account. So, just really um, 
I actually think that is a very, very important decision we made then. And I'm glad the staff and I'm aware the staff are doing a huge amount of work on the annual plan. I um, just wanted that. Um, wanted to say that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, anybody, any other councillors wish to make a comment about the 16th of April minutes? All right, um, I'll call for uh, Councillor Hands. Would you like to um, move uh, that they are a true and correct uh, record of the meeting? Uh, and if we could ask Councillor Scott to second that. I'm happy to move that, please, Jenny. I'll move that the minutes are a true and accurate record with those corrections. And I'll second that, Jenny. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll put that to the meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. I'll take it as that you'll all say aye, and any aye. no to the contrary, no, I'll declare that carried. Thank you all very much. Um, now we have to move on to... Um, the minutes are from the 21st of April. Are there any um, matters of accuracy oh. that anybody would like to make about the 21st sorry, of April? Jenny, sorry to interrupt. I've also included the public excluded minutes from the 16th of April. Um, because they're just um, accepting minutes, they, those minutes can be confirmed in open meeting. Oh, all right. So sorry. Um, we'll just do those ones next then. And um, the, April, the public excluded minutes of the 16th of April. Has everyone had a chance to look at those? I'll move that they'll be accepted, Jenny. Thank Peter. you, Peter. Moved by Peter. Have we Have got a second, up? John? John, seconded by Councillor Sunkel. I'll put that that's a true and correct uh, record of the meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. I'll, aye. And, aye. and please indicate if there's any no's. Uh, there being no no's, I'll, I'll declare that carried. Thank you. So, Louise, we're now on to the 21st of April one. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone with any inaccuracies in the 21st of April meeting? All right. I'll ask, um, I'll call for a mover and a seconder for that me those minutes. Please speak up. I'm I can do that. that, Jenny. Okay, clear. Um, Councillor Mackay, moved I'm by Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor Marshall. Uh, I'll put that resolution that it's a true and correct record and adopt the minutes of the meeting of the 21st of April. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, please indicate. There being no one in opposition, I'll declare that carried. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we're up to item six, um, and this is about matters arising, and this relates to the 16th of April meeting. Uh, in that meeting, we established uh, two council working groups. Uh, one is called uh, the Planting and Regeneration Working Group, I'd just like to call on Councillor Craig Pauling to give a short a verbal update about that working group. Thank you, Councillor Pauling. Hi, kia ora koutou anō. Uh, firstly, I just want to acknowledge um, the leadership of the Chair and uh, pushing these two working groups along and also the support of the councillors to get them in place and, of course, the great work of our staff to get them underway. Um, so we met as for the first time last Thursday um, and had a very productive meeting. Uh, we talked about the focus of the of the work and had a discussion about that and really wanted to see a focus on accelerating outcomes for regeneration and tree planting across the region. Um, but we wanted to do that with a flexible approach in terms of the outcomes across our portfolios, in particular biodiversity, freshwater, climate change. Um, we also wanted to look, make sure we're flexible around the different tools and types of planting that will be done, including riparian planting, lowland streams, of course, wetlands, dryland planting, and even forest planting, um, and the need for sanctuaries and corridors um, across the region. Uh, we talked about the need to work with partners, of course, with our territorial authorities, um, the zone committees, uh, Papa Tipurunanga, as well as industry, uh, community groups, and landowners. Um, but our first uh, business is to do an internal stock take 
uh, to see what we have already uh, that what we're already doing, what we're already funding, and of course what other those other partners are already doing as well. Uh, we did speak of um, reinvigorating us and reconfirming our support for the Canterbury Biodiversity Strategy. Uh, that was um, supported by the territorial authorities, NITAHU and other groups as well. Uh, and our next steps are to flesh out the work program going forward. Um, and we will meet again in another three weeks um, to confirm that work program. And then we'll bring a formal update back to the next council meeting. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Clearwater has a question, Councillor Pauling. Uh, thank, thank you, Craig, for your report on the working group for the trees. I, I, I just around the biodiversity. I'm just uh, wondering how we can consider ensuring that, especially when it comes to planting of native trees, that we are going to have sufficient stock to um, to undertake the programs. Yeah, well, that's a that's an issue that faces uh, not just us if we're doing this, but all the groups that are already doing work. And I suppose it's just about us working with um, the nurseries that are out there and seeing what gaps there may be and if, how we can fill them. So that's definitely part of the stock take that's going on, uh, Councillor Clearwater. Thanks, Craig. And I'm just wondering, in fact, if that that is if somehow we, we, uh, what other ways we might be to support that, but we can discuss that later. But thank you. Kia ora. Uh, thank you very much. Any further questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Pauling, for that um, verbal report. Uh, Council Secretary, uh, do we need to have a resolution uh, receiving that report? Yes, we could do that. That would be good practice. Or shall I have one for both of them after the, uh, Councillor Marshall's done hers? Uh, you could do them one at a time in case something comes up for the next update. Chair, All right, well, yeah, well, it's Grant, Grant here. I'll, I'll move that the um, report from Councillor Pauling uh, be received by Council. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll second I'll, that, Jenny. And well, it'll done. be seconded by uh, Council, moved by Councillor um, Grant Edge and seconded by Councillor Lan Farn that the report from the Planting and Regeneration Working Group. Uh, be be received by council. I'll put that to the vote. All the people, please say aye. There being no um, one against, I'll just I'll declare that carried. Thank you very much, everyone. We're moving on now to the second report. It's called the Public Visibility Working Group, and I'll ask Councillor Nicole Marshall uh, to give a short verbal report. Thank you very much, Nicole. Kia ora, Chia Hui, mihi nui kia koe. Uh, our group met last Wednesday uh, to talk about how we can work with our staff and stakeholders to better improve um, how we interact with the wider public. Uh, we all agreed that it is the wider Canterbury public that we do want to be better engaged in communicating with. And what we really want people to understand is who ECAN is um, and what we do and give some more context and information around um, those big issues that people are always asking us about uh, and the importance of using people and, and our people to tell those stories. Uh, we had a really good conversation around mechanisms to do this um, and we've got a really enthusiastic team moving forward on these issues. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Any questions uh, for Councillor Marshall? All right, there being no questions, um, I would call for someone to move acceptance of uh, Councillor Marshall's report. Who would like to do that? Happy to do that, Jenny. I'm happy uh, to second, by, Jenny. Uh, moved by Councillor Claire Mackay uh, and seconded by Councillor Phil Clearwater that the Council accept the report of the Public Visibility Working Group. All those in favour, please say aye. I'll take it that everybody's in support. Um, there being no no's, I will uh, declare that carried. Thank you very much, councillors. I'd just like to note so that everyone's clear that uh, in the future, these uh, groups will be uh, giving written reports or written information so we can keep track of um, them at council meetings and that will be more formally on the agenda. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Council Secretary, is there anything else I need to do there before moving on to the next part? 
No, Jenny, all good. Thank you. Uh, please note that there's no committee reports uh, from performance audit and risk uh, to endorse at this stage because of the cycle of meetings that we're in. Uh, we're up to item seven on the agenda, matters for council decision. And now we'd, we'd like to turn formally to the zone committee guests that we have and the regional committee chair who we have with us. And I'll hand over to councillor Claire Mackay uh, to introduce this item and speak to it, please. Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, I'd just like to also welcome our guests today to this meeting. Um, Hugh Chair is the Chair of the Regional, Hugh Logan is the Chair of the Regional Committee and our respective Chairs, Ted Howard, um, Michael Blackwell and William Thomas of the Zone Committees that are presenting to us today and their deputies who uh, are sitting alongside them. Look, um, the Canterbury Water Management Zone Committees, they report annually to um, Council and also their T, the respective TAs um, on the progress around the implementing of their strategy in their zone. And um, one of the reasons around that is it's an opportunity for them to discuss the work that they've been doing and perhaps identify um, some of the challenges and opportunities um, that they see in, in the future. Of course, it also fulfills one of the requirements of our long-term plan um, that we have within Environment Canterbury. So, um, look, without further ado, I really just welcome you here and I'm going to hand over to Hugh first. He's on the list first, is that correct, Jenny? Yes, Hugh's first. Welcome, Hugh. Kia ora, kia ora tato, everybody. Um, in presenting the uh, annual report from the regional committee, I'm, I'm not going to go through it by blow by blow. I'm going to, going to highlight six um, issues through, we've covered through the year. And then I'm going to touch on looking to the future after that. Um, the most, probably the single most important thing that the committee was involved with in the past year was the finalisation and the agreement then from the mayoral forum for the 2025 and 2030 goals and targets. I think the committee and myself could not emphasise how important um, those goals and targets are. They help inform, in fact, more than inform, they drive uh, the future work program of the CWMS. Um, so I'll just say that they're a crucial piece in the whole framework of the strategy. Um, we received this year the fourth targets report, uh, which demonstrated solid progress, but there's still uh, quite a long way to go yet. Um, and I'll just emphasise that within the committee, there, there's sort of a, a, a split between those who recognise the progress that's been made and those who sort of have a sense of frustration about the speed of which we're achieving things. I think that's a natural occurrence when you have an event like this, um, but you, I think the councillors should be aware, need to be aware of that. Um, the the uh, committee has also um, taken a fairly light-handed um, oversight of the work on farm environment plans and audits. Um, I think it's fair to say that the committee was encouraged where that's going. The, the, the whole CWMS has made huge progress in that regard but it's an area that will require continuing oversight. Um, I then want to touch on an issue that's unresolved, but has taken up a certain amount of time of the committee this year, which relates to the goals and targets with respect to recreation and amenities. Um, work on recreation and amenities has, has come quite a long way at a zone level, but uh, recreation and amenities are in fact a regional issue as well. And uh, there's been some significant amount of work gone on, on in the last three years, which came to came together in a paper recommending actions in that regard, but which there's not yet a clear consensus on the regional committee and how to progress with this. Um, it's fair to say, though, that there's 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 a feeling within the committee that this work needs to be progressed next year, and there needs to be at least a. a clear regional strategy with regard to how recreational amenities goals and targets are being achieved. It's, it's kind of a floating gap in our system and approach at the moment. And finally, I want to touch on bio, some biodiversity issues. Um, we have focused on braided rivers and as a sort of a 
a side spin-off from that, the issue of fish screens, which you might say is, oh, well, you know, it's fish screens, it's a technical issue. It's actually a little bit of a symbol of, of how we progress um, both biodiversity and water quality issues. A lot of progress has been made on fish screens from, from really coming from a fairly awkward place probably three or four years ago. The technical work on fish screens now have been progressing quite well. Um, but the issue of braided rivers, braided rivers and how they're managed is will continue to be something that the committee would like to keep an eye on because it's not just a, a zone by zone issue. Braided rivers run right across the whole whole region, and in some cases they span different zones. So uh, those are the, the the focus of the regional committee for this year and, and uh, form the components of our annual report. I'll just touch now briefly on looking to the future. Um, looking to the future at a, at a regional at a regional level, there, there needs to be some a form of regional oversight onto progress with regard to targets and goals. Secondly, um, the government's freshwater action plan. Um, this, while this may be delayed in a um, COVID nineteen and post COVID nineteen world, um, it's not going to go away, and uh, I think we can expect to see. Um, some movement in that regard, not in the next six months or so, but probably beyond that. And that will be a matter that will have regional significance. Um, I've touched on recreation amenities. I think it needs, not, I think the committee thinks it needs further work, but as I said, within the committee, there's not a clear consensus yet on where that, where that should go to. And finally, an issue that continues to crop up and where there is quite a bit of considerable internal debate within the within the committee. It's in relation to climate change effects across the region as a whole. This won't come as anything of a great surprise to the um, to councillors, because no doubt there is an internal debate amongst councillors about the effects of climate change and where it will go. Um, but I think that the, the reason this debate is ongoing is because the implications of climate change for the CWMS remain somewhat opaque in the minds of people. And I, 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 the suggestion being that there needs to be, I think, a, a, a continuing engagement of the implications and effect, effects and then implications so that there can be then a more of a common understanding of the way forward in terms of water management. Um, it, it, the conversations at the moment tend to be at a generally high level without getting down into probably the more important things, which are the specific implications and how we adapt and um, accommodate change. So uh, that's my quick overview of the work of the Regional Committee for the last the, the previous year. Um, and I'll just leave it up to any questions that councillors might have. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Claire, are you continuing? Sorry, yeah, well, if you want me to, Madam Chair. Yes, you go okay. ahead. Look, thank you, um, Hugh, for um, a, quite a thought-provoking, actually, um, <laughs> presentation and making us think about um, some of the future things there. We have uh, two or three questions coming up here. So we've got Councillor Liz McKenzie first, uh, Councillor Scott, and then Councillor Clearwater. So, um, Liz? Yes, hi Hugh. Um, yes, my question is around um, looking at the future as well, um, and in particular with respect to the CWMS um, goals around biodiversity. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of a report late last year around um, baseline assessment of emerging contaminants in New Zealand, which found that there were ubiquitous unmonitored emerging contaminants in groundwater. Um, and that our current approach of just targeting a few things like nitrates, for example, um, is inadequate for monitoring these. Do you have any comments about um, where you might be looking in the future around emerging contaminants? Um, the committee itself has not grappled with that the specifics of that other than to a number of members have raised the same uh, have raised points about emerging contaminants particularly micro contaminants um, uh, things that we that, that uh, we haven't 
I don't think grapple with not just regionally but nationally. Uh, so I, th I think I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I think it's something that, that needs, um, I think the committee would argue, it, it, and I suggest that we can, it, it needs some fairly concrete, um, uh, not engagement is not the right word. I think I think we want to more clearly define the problem um, before we embark on the actions that might be required to address it. Um, and be mindful of what the national context is as well. I'll leave it at that, if that's okay for you at the moment, um, because you know, yep, I'm rather fine. sort of, I'm rather yep. taking this on the fly rather than having a considered, yep. considered response to you. Yeah. Here's Peter Scott, uh, Hugh. Uh, thank you for that. And um, look, I'm so pleased that you're doing this job for us because uh, you're here for Dodgers. Is something that um, that that's really appreciated uh, by me. Anyway, I, I was interested to the comment that you made uh, a couple of times. You would use the word oversight, and I don't know whether you use it in terms of the essential fresh water program that's coming forward or not. But do you have a view on that in terms of um, what you would mean by o uh, regional oversight? Um. Without going into sort of the detail on that, well, I, I think it, it's it's a question of um, being able to see things at from a regional level, and the councillors receiving comment from a third, if like a third party source, in this case the uh, regional committee, um, on regional matters, and also the question of integration and coordination. Um, natural resource management relies very strongly on integration. And the zone committees do an excellent job um, at a <clears throat> zone, at a zone level, but the, there is an integration role, and uh, um, that sits alongside that, which the regional committee, when if functioning well and effectively, can help um, assist with materially, and more importantly, help um, cement in place the legitimacy of. Uh, the various interest groups, stakeholders, and public input to um, to ECAN. I think just to step back and, and look at it, one one of the issues that 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 the whole water management debate in Canterbury got itself into in the 90s and early 2000s was this kind, was a kind of um, disconnect between the constituent parts of, of, of the entities who both manage water and are involved with water and the public. And that the whole process of our zone committees and regional committees is to add additional input and, legit, uh, and, and a form of public legitimacy, which, which assists the formally elected um, councillors such as yourselves in your decision making and your deliberations. So that's what I mean by oversight. Um, I don't mean a, a, a governance oversight. I mean an oversight um, of the the stakeholders and interest groups that 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 make up what what is our Canterbury community. Ah, uh, Claire, who was next? Are you are you still doing no. this? No. Yeah. So, no. yeah. Well, are you ready? Yes, I am. Kia ora, Hugh. Um, thank you very much for your report. And um, you might remember me from being a city council representative um, about three and a half years ago on the CWMS. And, and I want to acknowledge the work you have done and, and all, all the zone committees too. My question really follows what Peter's was, and it's really just, and, and you've given some explanation about us having, uh, as a council, having a, um, an integration sort of role. But it's, it, it's kind of like, who should who who do you believe should, should really lead out on establishing really like a, a whole strategy for climate change and uh, including agricultural emissions um, so that in fact you know that there, there is at least an overview of what we should be achieving well I think it's a <laughs> I think we don't want to see this issue of governance and coordination in, in, a, in a binary um, or in a binary sort of way. Uh, one of uh, this is, I think, one of the great advantages of environmental management is is um, where you can take everybody with you. 
And so clearly, in my view, in terms of water management and also in relation to climate across the region as a whole, the formal responsibilities lie with you people. You, you're the elected representatives of the community. But then there is, but I mean, as anyone involved in politics and governments know, uh, it's a good idea to take everybody with you. And therefore, you can set up mechanisms and ways in which you can take people with you. And that's the role of zone committees and um, the regional committee. It's, it's part of a process of taking everybody with you. You've got to involve other stakeholders as well. But I think it actually adds strength to your bow by having these, these mechanisms. As I said, it helps with the legitimacy of your final decision making. So, so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. No, th thank you, Hugh, because um, some of the zone committee reports have certainly been referring to their concerns about the very things they're talking about. So thank, thank you very much for, for that, for your I'll comments just, there. Can I just add another thing? Uh, uh, part of the, uh, a, a challenge for committees, um, of, of like the zone committees and the regional committees, is the, a number of individuals on these committees find this process at times challenging in the sense that they wonder what effect they're having. Um, this is not um, confined to Canterbury alone. It occurs in any form of groupings like this around the, around the country. Some people like to have their hands on the levers and they find it frustrating that they, in fact, in, in strict um, constitutional terms, they don't have their hands on the leaders. They're a voice, but they're not the ones that hold the levers. In, 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 in formal, strict constitutional terms, you're the ones that have your hands on the levers because you're the elected representatives, just as the councillors on district councils are also the formal elected people with their hands on the levers. That's, their, that's your formal role. Um, and however, I think people that have been around a while know that uh, groups like the zone committees, regional committees, and other stakeholders can have an effect by the voice they bring to the table. So, thank you, Hugh. That's very helpful. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much, Hugh, for that. Um, I always enjoy listening to what you have to say. But look, I just really, on behalf of the council, want to acknowledge um, your leadership of the regional committee. Um, in the past year, and I know that with an awfully big committee that we do have, at times it's um, quite a challenge to, to um, get all the thoughts and voices in some sort of a room. <laughs> mm. But look, really do appreciate that and you taking the time to come on today, and you're more than welcome to, to stay till the conclusion um, or disappear, as whichever you please. But. Oh, okay. excuse me, excuse me, Claire. It's Jenny here. Um, I see that uh, Councillor Southworth also has a question. Could we do that before Hugh leaves? Apologies. Sorry, thank you. I know it's, yeah. thank you. I know it's, tr it's tricky following all the things that was just it just popped into my head as you were answering that last question there, Hugh. Um, and um, I just want for various reasons, um, myself included, I know that the community members on this regional committee have sort of fallen away over the period of time between refreshes. And I just wonder what your view is in terms of that, you know, do, is it how important is it to have the full contingent of community members within the committee? Um, and, and it can be in not just necessarily this committee specifically, but committees in general, um, you know, when you're looking for that wide view or for a diverse voice. Um, if you could answer that, please. I'm my, uh, hi, Vicky. Um, look, my, my view. I think that the community voice, the community representatives, are crucially important, um, and they're partly fallen away because, in fact, we were due to refresh them last year, but then uh, council elections came along, so that was postponed, and now COVID 19s happened, and that's for, <laughs> come along as well. Um, but and this is a personal view, Vicky. My um, and, and it's based on also being a member of the a public member of the committee some considerable time ago. Uh, I think that some of the committee, the public committee members, are the best contributors to the work of the committee. Um, and it is certainly time to 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 examine that membership and those appointments 
um, this this year as a matter of some urgency because it, we're about a year and a half late on that purely because of the exigency of elections and the most recent current events. I was thinking as well, Hugh, there were a couple that, that actually didn't stay that long, like it's a three-year period, and I think within about the first year, one had gone, and within maybe 18 months, a second really didn't, a second didn't come. So I'm just wondering if there's a scope there for, would you feel that it was an import, important to have a mechanism where you could bring people in partway through a period between the stakeholder selection to account, to accommodate those types of things where people's situations change? Yeah, yes, is the answer, and the same. I, I would assume the same applies for um, for zone committees too. Lovely, thank you, thanks. Thank you very much, um, Vicky. Sorry, apologies about that, but but I don't see any more questions there now. So, yeah, once again, thank you very much, Hugh, um, for your contribution this morning and coming and talking to us as a council. So I'll now move on. We're going to go north to Ted. Um, are you still in the room, Ted? Uh, yep, I'm coming, bringing myself back to life. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to today's meeting. And I know you're very, very au okay fait with technology, so you'll you'll be fine. So yeah, if um, I'll hand over to you, um, and you can present for the Kaikoula. Um, same committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And thank you, councillors, for giving me this opportunity. Um, yeah, you have our report there. It was good to welcome Clint to the team last year and sad to lose Steve and Celeste. Um, Kevin, Murray, Heath, Peter, Jan, and the rest of the team from Kaikoura did great work. It was really good having um, Heath there in particular with his energy and focus, particularly on wetlands. Um, he's really moving things along, which is great to see. Uh, Kev's steady at the helm has been really good too. So most of our focus this last year was on wetlands, uh, good progress made in, on several. Our zone has lost over 95% of our wetlands, so restoring a few and retaining what we have left are high priorities. For me, it's kind of interesting looking on a global scale that to note the effect of culture, like our culture is one of pastoral farming and we've created pastures and destroyed our wetlands. Uh, in China, their culture is based on harvesting a swamp plant, rice. So they've turned their hillsides into swamps, rice paddies. And so just looking at the role of culture on our effect on the environment is huge. And it's been... Like in that context, it's been great to have gr very good engagement and involvement from the schools and from their youth and our low cleanup and our beach cleanup um, during the year. So those things are really good. Our culture is changing and the awareness of the need for diverse ecosystems is spreading. Um, I also note we're getting interesting results from post-earthquake science. Um, there is still significant remaining risk for which we have no existing mitigation strategies. So that's going to be an ongoing issue. Um, so generally speaking, it's been a good year. We've made good progress and we still have many significant and ongoing issues. And if I can just have a small aside, which is a follow on from Hugh's call to think of responses. But actually, just to consider the effect of New Zealand's response to coronavirus, we looked at what happened elsewhere. We saw the need for a response. We responded appropriately. So we haven't had to deal with the increase in funeral capacity that other countries have had to deal with. So if we can look far enough ahead and react sufficiently appropriately enough, we won't need to deal with the impacts of climate change because we will have solved the problem. And that to me is the approach we need to take. So with that thought, I'm open for questions and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Ted. Um, we do have a question um, from Councillor Sunknell, but before he goes, I just wonder if you might take the opportunity to 
enlarge on your comment there around the post-earthquake science, um, I'm guessing that could be a couple of um, aspects there. You've got a um, comment in the report around farming and wet conditions and irrigation efficiency work stream. Um, would you just like to enlarge on that and then we'll go to Councillor Sunkel and Councillor Edge. Okay, um, yeah, the, well, there's two separate things. The earthquake recovery project, which was a three-year project, uh, there's been a lot of good stuff come out of that. Uh, the, the thing I was referring to in the dangers is that um, GNS have a uh, geological nuclear sciences, Kevin, um, Chris Massey and his team, um, have projects going, looking at the movement of material coming down our waterways. So they're particularly focused on the hapuku and what's happened to the material from the big slip dam that came down there, and also looking at uh, the kofi. And in both of those catchments, there have been large amounts of material that have transported a short distance. And when I'm saying large, like the bed depth has increased between eight and 15 meters. So if you get an increase of 15 meters in your bed depth and that moves down to where it comes out onto the flats, then those rivers are not gonna stay in their existing beds, they're gonna go elsewhere. And we don't currently have a strategy for that. So that's on my radar is problem number one, might not hit us for 15 years, or it might hit us next year if we have another cyclone. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, John. Oh, thank you, thank you, Ted. I, I really enjoy my, my visits to Kaikoura, and I, and I go out quite regularly and enjoy just getting out on the plains and having a looking round and and having those chats with 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 Kevin as to what you're achieving there. And uh, through Hazard and Risk and River, well aware that we we actually took a lot of gravel out of the the Kofi only to have the event come up and, and almost put more back into it. So uh, recognise that challenge, and obviously I'm a hard hooker in, in the dam that's there. My question is that we've we've essentially given you as a zone uh, a non-regulatory role in a sense of, of just applying good non-statutory processes. Are you are you happy with with that regime and the way it's working? Uh, I've, I've got no real problem with it. Um, I actually enjoy that that process. Is there anything that you believe that might require some regulatory process, or are you happy to continue the way you are? Um, for the moment, and probably for at least the next two to three years, I think the way we're going is pretty close to optimal. Like, we're yet to reach the peak of the sociological impacts of the earthquake. That typically peaks at about five years. So that's when you get the greatest impact in terms of things uh, like suicides and break mental breakdown. It's when people's mental health is at the most critical. And we've got SARS on top of, oh, well, this COVID-19, um, COVID um, on top of everything else now. So, yeah, it's a, trying to find an optimal balance where we're meeting the needs of the water, where we're improving the ecosystems, and we're keeping our people together. Uh, I think the less hard regulation we have and that the better i think kevin's doing a great job and he's got a really good team and i thinking they i think that they're striking a very close to optimal balance thank you ted and i would love to get our councillors up there for a visit to to look at lyle creek look at the harbour and, and look at all the initiatives that are happening in that non-statutory space and and achieving what are our and the community's outcomes so yeah, congratulate you on the work collectively that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, Ted. Yes, my, my um, thoughts were also a little bit along the lines of John in terms of the community well-being uh, of people in Kaikoura. Um, yeah, that you've had the earthquake, we've got COVID, and like you talked about before, climate change issues coming up as well. Are you are you feeling that the community's still well supporting the initiatives of the zone committee and those sort of on the ground action projects? 
That's a really hard question, Grant. Um, like my feeling is that the vast bulk of the community are in survival mode. They're not supporting our projects because they're just trying to get enough to eat today. Uh, they can barely even think about next week, let alone the wider ecology. Um, but the school system and the children and that aspect of it is work, does seem to be working well and we're getting their engagement. And for those people that do have the time and energy to engage, that um, we're getting a good proportion of them. But there is this big missing gap in the middle of people that are too engaged in survival and recovery to give much thought to anything else at all. So, so Ted, from our perspective then, when the government and, and ourselves managed to review uh, a range of recovery kind of projects, um, then obviously that's going to be welcome. Anything that we can do by well, not only the zone committee, but, but the Kokura community. Don't know what they will be, uh, Ted, but the government was looking for sort of green kind of projects, which makes me think the um, loving the Lyle um, involving children, um, all those community spirit sort of things, are, are they the things that you think might be helpful to um, socially? Yeah, like Kaikoura is a tourist based town, like half of our, half of our economic activity is tourism and 95% of that is overseas tourism. So it's taking a huge hit. Um, on top of the hit it took three years ago for a year without tourism because of the earthquake. So that's going to be hard. There's going to be quite a number of um, industries, uh, individuals, businesses that just don't make it. Um, so anything that can give employment to people locally is a, is a good thing. There are many things that need doing. We have serious wilding issues, wilding pine issues on, on Mount Fife and particularly in the Kofi catchment that could be dealt with if we got into it now. That's something that the more fit and athletic could get involved in. Um, that'd be a great project to, to push ahead. But yeah, getting that sort of thing organized would be really good over the next few weeks. Thanks, thanks, Ted, and thank you very much for all the work that you do up there, and uh, you will be in touch through the Zone Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Just before we move to Lan, um, can I just ask Louise if she's seen the note in the box about David, or is it, no, Bill Thomas is trying to get in? Yes, thanks, Claire. Just spotted that. I'm just clicking, yep. hopefully clicking the right buttons to let him in. On thank that. you. Okay, okay. Um, Lan? Kia ora Ted and thanks for your work with the Zone Committee, um, you do a fantastic job. My question, I mean you've partially answered it um, in your answer to Grant's question, but it was really about um, particularly the challenge of, you know, the wetlands issue, <laughs> sorry my two year old's here, um, the wetlands issue that we're trying to address, address as a region and um, I mean we're looking right now at our annual plan budget and considering how we can best um, provide or distribute money in the area of biodiversity, but particularly around things like wetlands. And I mean, would you say for you and your zone, increasing something like immediate steps, which you would have, you know, the ability to distribute in the zone would be more beneficial or, would, or do you think it should be driven from ECAN where we're actually leaving that money more internal and we're making the decisions about where it goes. What are your thoughts on that? I'm all for co collaboration. Like there is the hard, there are some good projects um, that are being worked on here, but it's hard just getting them over the line where the, the stressed people involved um, can find enough space and energy to put their contribution in. Um, so Heath's been doing a great job talking to people and 
Yeah, I think between us, like working together, which is what we all do here in Kaikoura, like the the ECAN team in Kaikoura is as much a part of the the zone committee as as the rest. So yeah, if we can use our combined awareness and intelligence, we should be able to get funding to somewhere near the, an optimal place for it. If you've got some for us. Kia ora. Okay, thanks, Ted. So um, we've got a comment, a uh, question or a comment from Ian McKenzie. Ian? Uh, uh, hi, Ted. Um, I'm chairing the Wetlands for Assets program, which has got several projects uh, tagged for the cut, your, your area up there. Are you aware of uh, that project and, and um, uh, your, your zone's involvement with that project? I hadn't heard that particular name, no. It, it, it's, it's a combination, it, it's a joint project for, uh, between PGF, coordinated by Landcare Trust, and uh, heavily supported by the Regional Council, ECAN. Um, and, and it's targeting some of the wetlands that uh, were already part of a wetland restoration program going in Kaikoura. So it may, um, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try and get uh, some contacts put, put, put in touch with that program. Thank you very much. That would be great. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, nobody else is showing up on my chat page as uh, wanting to make any comments or question Ted on his report. But look, I just um, really appreciate Ted you taking the time to come on and um, talk to us today about the issues. Now, um, Kaikoura certainly was um, devastated with the earthquake and um, just a little bit of a silver lining I guess that's come out of that is the funding that has gone into there um, particularly that's been spent um, the post uh, the Kaikoura recovery um, Kaikoura plans recovery project um, and that has certainly expedited the implementation so to speak of um, of the zone or your zone um, plan and similarly, um, you haven't probably been um, deflected into a, a sub-regional planning process, which is what <laughs> which was what John was alluding to. So you have actually probably got um, the advantage of having those on the ground actions, which some other zone committees would dearly love um, to to see occurring in our own patch. But look. I um, really appreciate the fact that you've taken time to come to talk to us and acknowledging the difficulty with um, your community um, just dealing almost with their day-to-day -day life and um, concentrating on themselves. And that, that is particularly is important, but we mustn't lose sight of what we want to get done in the future as well. So let us know if there's anything that um, we can do. And I'm sure you'll feed that back in through your facilitator and um and Grant, who sits on the zone committee. So, um, what else have we got here? Thank you, Claire. Comment, comment just in the box. Um, thanking you from Clegg, Pauling, and uh, also from Councillor Clearwater, thanking you for a very good report, which emphasises the challenge. So, thank you, Ted. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs> right, we'll now move down the coast a little bit, and we'll milk, welcome. Michael Blackwell, and I think we've got Kim Henderson online as well um, from the Waimekalele. So very close to home. Lovely to see you guys. So, um, Michael, are you going to lead off on presenting the Waimekalele Zone Committee report? Just wondering whether Michael's still getting um, unmuted. Can anybody see if he's still in the building? Uh, Louise, can you help us or um, Duran? He, wa he was, he was. Uh, so, so, he was definitely here, yeah. Uh, now says no response. I don't know how to Cam, fix that. Cam, are you in the building? If you just can unmute yourself, which is the, um, if you move your cursor, a little line will 
back up in the middle and it's the second box in with a little microphone. Uh, yes, uh, hopefully you can hear me here. Thanks, Clint. Yeah, well, hopefully we can get Michael Black on, somebody's uh, Michael back in, somebody's just sent him another invite. So maybe while we're doing that, you might like to lead off. I'm sure you're capable of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Claire, and, um, and uh, hello to, uh, to everyone on the call. Um, I'm actually sitting out in the middle of the farm on this um, beautiful blue sky, sunny Canterbury day. So um, hopefully my signal holds up for, uh, for the duration. Um, so I guess in Michael's um, absence, uh, unfortunately, I don't have our report in front of me. Uh, well, this text as read. Um, a couple of highlights. Really, the, the zone committee from the regulatory and uh, um, zone process waiting for an outcome from uh, PC7 as a flow on from our, our zipper work. Um, obviously, with delays in that process, uh, a lot of our community is um, sitting and waiting the outcome of that to really provide some direction. Uh, in terms of where, where uh, particularly some of the high risk farm land use activities are heading in the near future. Um, so in the meantime, oh, yeah, in, in the meantime, um, the zone committee has been progressing with um, some of the non-statutory work as part of the zipper process, um, focusing firstly on some of our coastal stream catchments. So beginning to put together. Uh, a process and an outline for um, catchment management plans for some of our coastal stream areas. So uh, the first of those uh, under the Taranaki um, waterway is underway um, and has obviously been put on hold with community meetings while we deal with the COVID crisis. But uh, that is our, our first uh, trial, so to speak, of getting a, a catch management plan um, up and running. Um, it's been a little bit slower than we would have liked, um, but uh, as with all these things, the first time you do anything, um, it's a bit of a learning process, so we are working our way through that one. Um, beyond that, um, we are continuing our engagement with, uh, with with various groups in our community, particularly the farming group. Um, we have uh, the the next generation farmers, a group of predominantly young farmers, but they've broadened out to include many of our um, dairy and, and non-dairy farming um, uh, owners and operators in the district, and um, they provided a huge amount of input in the zipper process um, as they are with PC7 and um, we're hoping we can continue that engagement, high level of engagement as we move into the into the non-statutory uh, practices as well. So there's been talk already around um, around working with these farmers around improved monitoring or better monitoring of groundwater and um, surface water, getting farmers on board and doing a lot more on-farm testing um, uh, alongside uh, I guess a lot of discussion around where I know wetlands have come up as a topic today already, um, where the most effective investment might be um, on farm for some of those projects. And we've uh, just just uh, approved immediate steps funding for a, uh, a new wetland construction around Burgess Stream, uh, which is a bit of a demonstration project with WIMAC irrigation in our district uh, to showcase what, what, can, uh, what can be possible uh, when you fence off a uh, uh, what was largely a degraded area, um, pasture related, and um, and try and turn that back into something that's uh, really a, a really neat showcase of the biodiversity and what's possible with wetland planting. So um, that's that's probably about all I've got to add. Um, I'm not too sure is Michael on the on the call now. Can you hear me there? Can oh, yes, yes, oh, yes, yes, we can, Michael. Um, I'm not quite sure how much you've heard of that, but. Um, uh -oh. I've been here all along, Claire. I just couldn't uh, quite. Apologies. <laughs> so, um, as you can see from what Cam said, um, I have a very able deputy, so I don't really need to say a lot. Um, I, I thought I'd probably touch on a couple of things that, that I haven't put in the report, really, is what I wanted to do. And there's a lot of threads with with what's come before us in this meeting with what Hugh and Ted have touched on um, that I'd just like to pull together if that's possible. Um, Hugh talked a wee bit about the frustrations of this process which have been weighing heavily on me I must confess because sometimes it seems like we go round and round and round and there's no actual improvement in our, our rivers and streams. Um, but as you said quite rightly, it, it is a process and it's about behaviour change. Um, 
and it, there, is, there is something starting to happen. Uh, when I first joined this committee, I think it's three and a half years ago, whenever we went to WDC meetings, uh, the constant talk of drainage there, any, any reference made to a drain was solely as a utility. Well, well, Waimakariri Council now is starting to come to the understanding that those drains are an extension of our rivers and streams. And what flows through them flows into our rivers and streams. And, and they're starting to treat those bodies as, as living water bodies, which, which is a huge, really a huge step forward. Um, I went to Kaikoura with Andrew Arps in early 2018 and had a very informative day up there on a, on a wetland outing. And it was almost like a revelation for me. There was two things happened, just it, it highlighted the importance of those wetlands for what we're trying to do in this process as, as a tool, nature's way of dealing with excess. Um, and also, Kevin, as we walked along uh, one of the farmer's tracks there, I was having a yak to him, and I just said to him, well, what's the one piece of advice you can give to me as we go forward? And he said, if you work with the willing, you feel like you're getting a lot more progress. And I think that's very true. Um, there is a lot of goodwill out there. And it's very easy to get sidetracked onto sort of negative voices. Can't change those straight away. So working with the willing is, uh, is a very important thing. Um, so if we just go back a wee bit, as, as Cam said, we, we worked through uh, Zipper documents. They were very intense period. Change sevens in the, in the process at the moment. Um, we really, as a, a zone committee for the last nine months, have been treading water. We have had uh, support from, from good council staff, but I don't think there's enough there. One of our main goals was to create catchment management plans. And there seems to be a roadblock there. I would love uh, the councillors, if, if you can get together as a collective and perhaps see some way forward to facilitating that, that would be wonderful because the catchment management plans for us are something we can roll out across each of our water bodies. And that gives us an overarching document with which all of our community groups and non-regulatory um, actions can fall into. Um, Councillor Farm, you talked about uh, possibly increasing the immediate steps funding. I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and then Councillor McKenzie was talking about the wetland project, which again, my, my drive at the moment is with uh, the WDC, I'd love to see a whole series of wetlands incorporated within the rural drainage network because it's something we can control and advance faster. Not, please, please be clear, I'm not trying to compromise the efficiency of that network when it's needed for, for high rainfall events, but it's 90% of the time when, when the drainage system is flowing at a normal rate, there is a huge capacity there to incorporate wetlands. So I understand uh, Environment Canterbury has its own network of drainage. So possibly that's an idea that could be overlapped and adopted there as well. And that I think is all I can really add. Um, I've opened up for questions if there's any there. Thank you, Michael. A very eloquent um, request from us and also explanation of the frustrations and the, the challenges for the Zone Committee. Um, we do have a couple of uh, people wanting to raise questions. So Councillor Pauling and then Councillor Edge and Southworth in that order, please. Hi, kia ora. Uh, tēnā, tēnā kōrua, Cameron uh, and Michael. Thanks so much for your... Um, presentation um, and thanks in particular Michael uh, for your words there about the shift in the thinking around drains in the Waimakari district it's it's great to hear it's something that I've um, 
had experience in too, working with mana whenua and in the Salwan district. So uh, it's great to hear similar things are happening. And um, I agree also uh, with your comment about working with the willing. It's definitely uh, a good way to go at the start of a um, process. So well done. Um, I just had uh, a question about the future challenges and opportunities uh, in the report. In particular, I was really uh, interested in two things. Um, one was about the work you're doing on the solutions program and if you could give us an update on where that may be. And the other one was about the recommendation 3.25 and your zipper about the targeted uh, rate uh, for waterways. I was really interested in that, so it'd be great to hear a bit more. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start with 3.25 first, if, if that's um, helpful. Um, Again, um, any problem becomes slightly easier to solve if you've got more money to throw at it. And I appreciate we need to be very sensitive in the current post-COVID situation where money is going to be tight across all industries. Um, but the, the 3.25 came about as a possible option for targeting specific rating for specific projects across the district. Um, that's really all I can add on that one. Cam, have you got anything you want to throw in there as well? Um, no, not really. I guess, it, as you said, Michael, it's one of the many options for funding if we do end up with some rather pricey projects at some point as part of the catchment management plan or in work with uh, WDC. Um, that this was a recommended funding option that, that might work in some catchments. All right, and I apologize. Yes, I'm just trying to... the, other one, the other one was the solutions program that you're um, talking to the community about. Well, again, that, that's coming back too. So we let's just use our Taranaki stream as, as our first cab off the rank as a project that we're working on. So it's more or less a focus group that we've pulled together different sections of this, um, the local community, whether they be rural, urban, uh, recreation. And we're trying to highlight issues that each of those groups have with that particular water body and its activities. And by identifying those specific problems, we can try and come up with a solutions package that fits that particular water body. Um, so again, it comes back to this overarching a catchment management plan that hopefully can tick boxes for all members of the community or, and it, all groups that are involved and identify problems and mitigate them at the time, um, which comes back to that has caused, uh, and I think probably is, because it's the first one we're trying to do, we do need help to try and get that started. And, and I think once we've got that first catchment management plan, that's going to give us a template to then move on to other, other streams and water bodies in our district. Thank you. Kia ora kōrua. Thank you. Grant. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Michael. Um, as you know, being on the zone committee for nine years, um, certainly the uh, philosophy behind catchment management strategies is something that um, I'm extremely interested in. And, and in fact, in, in order to, in, in your comment about some assistance from council, um, I have been engaging with um, staff and they're looking at some things that I've, some information that we had developed a couple of years ago. So just to try to advance that coordination aspects and just see how we um, can move those things along in terms of establishing some kind of uh, template system. So there's a bit of um, com commonness in, in the way these things are handled. And, and really in terms of this targeted rate stuff, once you've got that catchment management plan, it, it then provides a mechanism to set some priorities. So you're looking at issues, opportunities, set priorities, then actions, and money goes along with that as well. So it's kind of a really good thing. Um, I, I note your comment about um, behavioral change. 
and and I too um, am aware of the huge um, successes that um, in, uh, Waimakariri District Council have made in terms of behavioural thought processes in, in what they're doing. Um, and they, they've, they just last year established the Land and Water Subcommittee um, to basically look at zone committee zipper projects and, and give them some, uh, advance them along as part of the TA uh, process. So, uh, I mean, that's really good to see. Um, I, I like your idea too, as um, Craig was saying about creative wetlands, incorporating those in a broader scale across the catchment um, to, to basically hold up those uh, those uh, floodwaters and stuff a little bit before they come into urban environments. Um, a question I've got in, in terms of this behavioural change thing, um, it, maybe Cam could answer this, but uh, the Next Generation Farming Group um, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of talk about regenerative farming, and I just wondered if he could let me know or let us know if there has been any progress, any significant progress in the way that um, the agricultural sector is responding, uh, responding to uh, better systems um, ac across the district. Um, thanks, Grant. Yes, there there is a number of projects in the district and across Canterbury uh, that's being monitored by various farming groups um, that I guess all tie in in some way to regenerative farming principles. Um, I guess as as a broad overview, regenerative farming, for those that may not have come across it before, is around doing as as little as possible to the land and just working with the the natural biology, um, fewer inputs, fewer disturbances of the soil. Um, the majority of New Zealand pastoral farming is very close to what most people would call regenerative farming. Um, other than the fertiliser inputs, we're not big users of, of pesticides and we don't cultivate our soils very regularly. Um, but there are projects on that fertiliser front. I note probably the big one in the Waimak district is Landcorp or Palmu's um, experiment on fertigation where they are using the irrigation system for fertiliser purposes as well and have found they've been able to cut their fertilizer use by more than 40% and still retain their pasture production. Um, so that's that's an early stage result, but that's just one of uh, many examples, others around uh, diverse pasture species. So um, people putting in, I've got two neighbors up here near Oxford who have got large areas and diverse pasture species, upwards of 10 to 20 different species that um, didn't require any cultivation, aren't being fertilized or not being sprayed. And really they just want to check to see what sort of yields and production they can get out of it. So there are there are the um, the experimental few uh, that are giving us a go. It's probably a wee while away from becoming mainstream, but um, yeah, we are certainly watching those with um, with a lot of interest. Great, thanks. Right. Shall I jump in? It's Vicky Southworth. Yeah, yeah. Um, go, yeah I was just um, really interested to hear a bit more about the Burgess Stream Wetland project and how that's come about how is that the one what what was the mechanism or the process towards to arriving at that one being the one that you feel is the showcase one the one that that you've all got agreement to to work on you know is it to do with the particular landowners in that area a particular issue how how did that come about I'd just like to hear a bit more please Cam do you want that one or shall I jump in way go Mike Okay, um, so Burgess Stream has been on and off the table for quite some time. Um, the the Waimak Irrigation was looking for uh, a project that they could possibly showcase. They did a lot of work themselves, um, which possibly was off on a bit of a tangent to where they needed to go. Once they finally got um, some good advice and assistance from ECAN staff, um, they've managed to sort of tailor the project to um, tick all the boxes in terms of the criteria of acceptance for uh, the immediate steps program. Um, it's probably a small a small forward step. I think it's fair to say that there is limited uh, it has limited score on the biodiversity scale, um, but. It, 
think of it as an olive branch if you like to try and get some traction in that area i'm a firm believer in, in promoting as much as possible and not trying to knock any enthusiasm um we have we have uh, in the same meeting past three or four other projects through um that were accepted for immediate steps just in the march meeting um and they are some of those have a lot higher ecological values and would be better projects from an environmental point of view. Does that sort of fill fill things in for you? Yeah, that, that's helpful. Something Thanks. to that. Oh, sorry. Can I just add a comment to that? I, I think the um, because the criteria for immediate steps generally uh, assesses the the current biodiversity and a lot of uh, what you call wet, wetland restoration. Um, really, there is. On the Burgess's stream example, very little there to start with. So this, I think, could be a good example of what's possible to achieve if it's um, done correctly from scratch. Um, so where there is nothing really there to start with, and um, what you can do. Um, so it's probably a longer time frame type project to see some of those results, but slightly different uh, aspect to simply restoration. This is almost re rebuilding of wetlands from scratch. That's really interesting to hear, and um, certainly the IMS step, um, the immediate steps um, sort of criteria is something that that we can can be usefully looked at from time to time. And that, that was interesting to hear. That thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, there aren't any more questions for you. There's a couple of comments here. I'll just pass on. Councillor Hans, Hans, um, Megan. Thanks very much, Michael. Great report, and thanks, Cam, for for dialing in from your paddock. I'd love to see a lovely sunny day. We've just come out of the fog here in Cust. Um, <laughs> but look, yeah, so look, I really just want to, um, on behalf of the council, um, extend our um, thanks for taking the time to come and present the Waimaka Early Zone Committee. Um, look, close to home to me and really um, enjoyed listening to where you've got to in the last years. So. Um, keep up the good work, guys, um, and we'll see you back next year. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, if I could just Thank you. Wait, bring one point up just before I sign off, because I do have to go back and try and remember how to be a retailer today, seeing as we are now at level two, <laughs> which is probably quite exciting. I'll have to put my trousers on instead of my shorts. Um, we had Tim Davies do a presentation to our committee late last year because we'd had some ongoing discussions on uh, minimum flows of the Waimakariri River. And he gave uh, quite a good report that sort of filled in a few blanks. That was followed up in the 3rd of February in our one of the meetings by Murray saying that, <coughs> the question, sorry, I have to go back. I asked Tim Davy just when the Alpine zone uh, plan change would sort of kick off because that's what's needed to address a lot of the problems with the Waimakariri. Um, Murray uh, uh, facilitator sort of indicated that it is still in the pipeline and was scheduled for 2026, 20, 27. I don't want an answer right now, but I just wanted to raise the red flag that just how important this one will be for the health and well-being of the waterways in our district. Um, and that the council is present, sort of just keep that one in sight and keep keep pushing it along, please. That's my final parting shot, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for taking every opportunity you can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, I'm just aware that we've had, no, we haven't got. So we've got, um, Ian, you're going to uh, present on behalf of Bill Thomas for the Ashburton. Is that how I'm reading the messages here? No, uh, Dave Moore is going to lead. I'm, oh, I'm going right. to uh, support him if I can. So, Dave, are you um, yes, around? Okay, Dave, just... well, then I'll pass over to you. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get Bill the chair on yes. um, for some sort of reason. But, um, yeah, I'll pass over to you now. Thank you. Kira, sure, thank you. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Dave Moore. I'm the zone facilitator for Ashburton and Lower Waitaki. Uh, yes, unfortunately, we did test it with Bill this morning, but something has gone wrong and he isn't able to get on. So um, I'll take the report as read. Uh, probably the, the main highlights um, 
or oh, main issues in the zone are the Ashburton River consent review, which is, is really a big one. It's um, you know a big thing for the community, um, trying to get that six cubics of water for the 2023 plan. And um, you know, for some people, that's a very difficult um, thing to wrestle with at the moment. Um, the Ashburton Lakes is something that came up last year. Um, a doc report on the Ashburton Lakes and the declining water quality there um, is very concerning. So there's um, there's a multi-party uh, group looking at that, including um, Runanga and Doc, the farmers, ECAN and councils. So um, that's that's a big thing on the on the um, horizon there. And uh, yeah, there's several other um, projects going on as well. But I guess open for questions and. Um, Hoping if I can't answer them, that Councillor McKenzie may be able to. Thank you, Dave. Um, we do have one question here from Councillor Pauling. Mm -hmm. Craig. Oh, I tried to undo it because because um, because ah. <laughs> uh, Dave started talking about it as I was uh, pushing it, but it was just in relation to Ortu Fotikai, the Ashburton Lakes, and um, just yep. was interested in um, that issue. But yeah, you've sort of covered it that there's a there's some work going on, um, collaboration amongst all the parties, so that's great yes. to hear. But anything else you could share on that would be great. I'm not, I'm not closely involved in it, but my understanding is that um, the science people from ECAN, the farm, and, um, farm advisory kind of people from ECAN are, are um, working with the landowners and looking at what solutions can, can be in place going forward. Um, but there are, I think, uh, there's been a couple of um, fairly large hurries at the start of it to uh, try and make sure the players that need to be involved are. Um, and there's been a, a few um, updates to the zone committee as well, but I'm sorry I haven't got a lot more detail no, than that. No, thanks David. I just did some work with um, yeah, Arul Whenua and uh, Department of Conservation about 10 years ago up there. It's a beautiful place, so it's um, mm. be great to continue to look after it and enhance it. So, Kilda. Oh, I think so. I think it's seen as a, um, as a jewel in the zone. And, and uh, uh, Craig, if I can uh, chip in here, Bill Thomas uh, did tell me this morning when I talked to him uh, that uh, uh, the landowners are fully engaged. Uh, and there's, there's, there's two separate issues. There's, there are, some of the lakes are surrounded by a conservation park and they're not related to any farming activities, and yet the TLIs uh, are still above targets for some of those. And then, of course, there are those lakes that are downstream from uh, some intensification that has gone on in the inland Ashburton Basin. Uh, and so the landowners, where they can uh, uh, provide solutions, are working on that, as I understand it. Uh, but of course, there are some which are sitting up in conservation areas where there's not much uh, that can be done. Thanks, Thank you, Ian. Ian. Um, I see, John, you'd also like to uh, add something um, yes, if I could, and I had a wee bit of a conversation with uh, Nadine uh, yesterday on, on these matters, and those, those folk up there around the sensitive lakes were very early in getting their, their farm consents and things in place. So what we're really trying to, to understand is, um, have the changes they've made uh, actually given effect to uh, the outcomes that we've got, or is there a time lag? Um, we believe that they are compliant with, with the rules that they've put in place. Uh, we accept it's an iterative process, uh, but just really need to understand um, what is happening and, and the time constraints to, to see where it gets. So um, as, as Ian and, and others have alluded to, a lot of work happening in that space with a very uh, connected and engaged community. Thank you, John. I mean, just adding to that, uh, talking about people having the high country at their heart, just in the last week or so, I watched a video on the Todd um, Hunter family around Lake Heron, and they were definitely talking about the importance of um, the environment in that lake to them. So, um, and I think that's just reminiscent of a lot of our farming families that um, live and work in the high country areas. Just one thing, Dave, and, and I'm not sure who, who's best to answer it with respect to the Ashburton um, River flows. I seem to recall earlier on there may be quite a stretch to try and get that six cumex into the Ashburton River, even with um, the Ashburton River consents reviews. 
Is is that look a correct understanding, or has there been a change in some science work um, which shows that we will in fact get that six cumex in by 2023? It's a it's a tricky question. Um, I certainly, think the latest the latest science work um, that's come out since you know the plan was done, I think, is showing that it, it is it is difficult, um, and it is it is only modelling. So we you know we um, we won't know till we get there. I guess um, I'm not sure um, if you have any other comments on that. Ian, um, it is it is really challenging. That's for sure. Yeah, the, the um. As I understand it, Claire, that, that the uh, one of the issues uh, there are about 50 uh, consent holders who think that by pulling in the consents, that they'll effectively have their consents uh, to irrigate uh, cancelled and they're questioning um, the legal position of that in terms of you, know, you can pull in the consent uh, to review it, but you can't effectively destroy it while it still has time to run and these consents are fall into that category because uh, the river yeah the, the, uh, effectively and so they're challenging that science so there's still a bit of angst and uh, there's a hardcore of uh, irrigators or extractors that haven't got a solution to other sources of water at this stage and then there's, uh, there's a group working with ECAN uh, to try to uh, resolve that with uh, science and various other solutions. Yeah, th thanks Ian. I mean, look, I don't want to get into the the, the <laughs> politics of it, but I think it's it's going to be a key challenge for the zone committee around that messaging. If if in fact we go through all this pain and um, we, ca we can't meet what we thought we were going to have according to a planning um, regime. So, so a okay. challenge so um, for the zone committee going forward. As I understand it, you know, the, the numbers were reliant on uh, uh, closing down a significant amount of stock water race, uh, which has been done, and that still doesn't look like it's putting enough water back in the room. And I think that's the number. It. It's, it's the issues around that. Does anybody else have any questions they'd like to raise with Dave or Ian, who's supporting in Bill's absence today? My chat box is silent, so look, I um, really appreciate the time, uh, Dave, that you've been sitting there and the efforts you've been trying to make in the background, getting Bill to join um, for the meeting. But if you can pass on our thanks on behalf okay. of Council for the work that um, he does as Chair and, of course, to all Design Committee members for the work they've done and, of course, all the staff, both um, Ashburton District Council and ECAN, yourself and other ECAN staff involved. So really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will do. And I just close by saying that, um, you know, the, the committee is in, in very good heart. I think they're a very well functioning, um, uh, good, good committee. And uh, yeah, the future was good for them. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, well, it's Chair Jenny back online now. Well, I've been online. I'll just um, resume the chair, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all those um, contributors that are still in the room with us for this meeting. I thought that was a fabulous um, uh, report back from the regional committee and the uh, zone committees that were here. I really found that uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so we just got to move on now, and I will um, take it that, uh, uh, Councillor Mackay, that you will move um, that the, rece the reception of, by the Council of the Regional Committee Annual Report, the Kaikoura Zone Committee Annual Report, the Waimakariri Zone Committee Annual Report, and the Ashburton Zone Committee Annual Report. Moved by uh, Councillor Claire Mackay, and I'll take a second. Who's that? Councillor Edge? Pauling. Yep. Councillor Pauling. Seconded by Councillor Pauling. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Anybody in um, opposition? I'll take it that there's not. I'll declare that carried. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, we're moving on now to uh, item 7.2 of the agenda, which is a submission on accessible streets regulatory package. And I would ask uh, Councillor uh, 
Scott to lead this item, please. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, 7.2 Accessible Street Regulatory Package. Uh, the recommendation is that it delegates to the Chair approval of the Environment Canterbury submission on Waka Kotahi New Zealand Transport Agency's Accessible Streets Regulatory Package. And we should note, so that's a recommendation, and we should note uh, that the submission is due on the 20th of May. This is an advanced draft. Oh, I think there might even be uh, another advanced draft above this one. And it will be circulated, circulated again before it is signed off. And so with that, I'll take it that everyone's read that and I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Jenny. All right, well, it's moved that um, it delegates to the chair and uh, to approve the Environment Canterbury submission on um, Waka Kotahi New Zealand um, Transport Agency's Accessible Streets, a regulatory package moved by uh, Councillor Scott and seconded by Councillor Edge. I'll put that to the vote. Uh, Jenny, could I speak to it just before we do? Oh, yes, I any questions? <laughs> Sorry, oh, I'm a state. <clears throat> Just to look, I, pre I appreciate it has yet to be um, signed off. I, I sent a, a, the last copy that's been received from the staff th through to all councillors, so everybody will have a copy of it, as Peter said. Um, and and we, we've had good discussion about it, but it just I think, um, yeah, th there were some quite concerning issues, and staff have raised those, especially with the speed of, of um, that's bit, that um, that's been proposed. Um, like for example, 50 kilometres per hour. Um, on shared pathways, that's faster than than the speed limit on some of our city streets, like by 20 k's, um, and and even like the speed of 15 kilometres per hour uh, for scooters and bikes on footpaths. Well, certainly, scooters will be legal. So um, I think the staff have addressed that well. What I will just ask, um, just for consideration though, is that since COVID-19, that we might also comment on the safe width of the path of pathways. Um, yeah, because that, that, that is a feature. There's, there's some reference to uh, taking into account width and separation, but I just wondered if we might be able to emphasise that. So I'm happy, oh, someone else has seconded it. That's fine, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Clearwater. We'll note that and make sure that additional piece experience of COVID-19 is included in our submission. And uh, as Councillor Scott has noted, it will be circulated again. Uh, and uh, it's due fairly soon, so we'll have to get on to that. So it's moved and second. I'll put that to the vote. All those people in favour, please say aye. I'll take it that no one's against, and I'll declare that carried. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Councillor Scott. We're on to item 8.3 now. Local Government Funding Agency amended documentation, and I'll hand over to Councillor Sunkel to lead that discussion, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an item we had some brief uh, discussion on this morning. Uh, members raised uh, issues of uh, had it been through the Park Committee <clears throat> and uh, wondered why we had not had a briefing. Uh, my view and, and the organisation's view of this is that it is a, a procedural document and that we are simply signing up to amendments uh, proposed by the Local Government Funding Agency uh, they have a number of shareholders as TAs. Uh, we are not a shareholder of the organisation, but we do utilise it for our funding through local government. It is our opportunity to borrow money at the cheapest rate that we can uh, out there. And so very important that we do sign up to the agreements. The changes that they are articulating uh, revolve around uh, council owned organisations and the ability for those to uh, borrow directly rather than the parent, uh, parent uh, TAs or regional authorities, and also the allowance of testing of uh, the levels of, of financial ability of those subsidiary organisations rather than the parent body if, if required. Uh, none of those actions apply to us at this point in time as we do not have a council controlled organisation it may be at some point in the future to our benefit. So uh, the financial effects of this are, are nil uh, unless we do not sign. If we do not sign, uh, we then do not get access to that, those monies. 
And at this point in time, those monies are quite cheap in comparison to uh, commercial paper and borrowing. Um, that's really all I have to say on it. It is con uh, procedural. Our, our legal and accounting teams have been through it. It is just an amendment to the, the relationship and the agreements that we have in place. So uh, unless there are any questions, I would uh, pass on to Councillor Hands to move the recommendations. Hi, Thank you, John. From Councillor Scott, I think. Is that right? The Councillor Scott? Yes, there is, Jenny. Just, I'd just like to reiterate what I said uh, about this document before. It is a big document uh, to be going through and to understanding it. Um, and so, therefore, um, I, I, I defer to the PAR committee on this. Uh, and, and I think that's the right channel, an obviously cha obvious channel for it. And I would take into account that the fiduciary duty around this will be fulfilled. And uh, th then I'm happy with that. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Councillor Clearwater. Yes, the financial impact would be if we did not sign. And Councillor Edge, uh, you want to speak? Thanks, Chair. Yes, just really um, offering up my support for um, signing up to this uh, process. It's um, as far as I'm aware, it's it's in line with our liability management policy. And it actually positions the regional council to potentially deliver a better uh, level of service um, in the future to the long-term benefit of the health uh, and environmental um, makeup of, 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 our, of our region. And uh, it just basically gives us the ability to um, borrow at an extremely cheap rate to help deliver and uh, for future projects and so, yeah, it's got my uh, my support. Thank you for that support. All right, I'll, I'll take it that it's moved uh, by Councillor Megan Hands that we approve uh, Councillor John Sunkel and Chair Jenny Huey to execute the following local government funding agency documents on behalf of Canterbury Regional Council. One, the multi. Uh, issue a deed to the guarantee and indemnity and three, the, the note subscription agreement. Um, I'll take that as seconded by Councillor Peter Scott. All those in favour, please say aye. Anyone against? I don't see anyone voting against it, so I'll put that to the meeting and I'll declare it carried. Thank you all very much. Uh, now we're on to an, a public excluded item. We're up to item eight on the agenda, page 255 of the agenda on our online copy. Uh, I'll, I'll call for a mover and a seconder to move into public excluded, please. Happy to I'll move, move John Sunkel. Uh, moved John Sunkel and seconded uh, Phil Clearwater that we're moving into public a public excluded item. I'll put that to the vote. Uh, please also, I, I'll take it that there's no one against, I'll declare that carried. We are in public excluded now, and the reason that we've gone in here is to pass the minutes. Um, there's no other business. Number 10, I and the CEO have had no notification of notices of motion. Number 11, likewise, we've had no notification of any questions under the standing orders. We're up to item 12. The next meeting will be on Thursday, the 21st of May, 2020. I'd just like to invite um, Councillor Pauling to give us a, a closing karakia, please. Uh, kia tēnā koe, Jenny. Uh, tēnā koutou, he rau rangatera mā. Uh, ka hui hui uh, mai nei. Uh, he mutunga o tātou nei hui tēnei rā. Uh, so just a uh, big thank you to everybody again uh, for another great meeting and uh, in particular to our guests we had uh, to share their work uh, under the CWMS um, and to anyone else who's going to watch this on the public feed. So, um, all right, he karakia um, whakamutunga or tato nei hui, uh, just a karakia to close. Uh, unu here, unu here, unu here ki te uru tapu nui a tāne, 
kia wātea, kia mama, te nākau, te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata, koia rā e rongo, whakaiiri aki ronga ki a tina, haumie, huie, tākie. Tākie. Well, thank you all. We'll leave the meeting now.